Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for putting together this uh, this really uh, extensive event, I think, which touches uh, a lot of different domains in typology and finance matter. It's really nice to be a part of it. Um, so before we begin, uh, let me quickly say um, I am trying my best to keep an eye on uh, both the Q&A in the chat. So uh, do, uh, uh, do write in either of the channels if you have questions. But uh, otherwise, uh, also, you, uh, I always welcome questions uh, uh, outside of the session, so you can write me on Slack or otherwise. So now uh, let's talk a bit about the plan. I have uh, three hours, which is a lot. And um, uh, I, I also have now a continuous slot of two hours. So you'll have me for a while from now. Um, so first of all, uh, we will have a break. Uh, I don't want you to expose you to a continuous two hour long nonstop lecture. Uh, and uh, I thought about uh, how to what I would like to tell compared with uh, with what speakers were already there. And I think this uh, this sort of um, uh, is uh, what I what I could meaningfully share with you that was not covered yet. So uh, first of all, I'm going to give an overview of uh, my runners and quantum computation. So you have been exposed to quite a bit of topology, topological invariance, topological materials. Uh, Majoranas are a, on the one hand, a closely related topic, and on the other hand, a sufficiently different topic, uh, which is uh, which has uh, both its uh, own difficulties and uh, its own interesting aspects. And I'm going to discuss this. Now, this is going to be uh, very much a discussion and an overview of a field. There is not a lot I'm going, not a lot of code I'm going to show. Uh, I am, however, going to switch gears uh, after this first lecture. Uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, quantum transport and in particular the quant package for uh, quantum transport simulations. Uh, so this is when you will see the code and I'm going to give examples uh, on how to implement what you want. Uh, now, importantly, I cannot give justice to either of the two topics in a, in a span of a couple of hours. Uh, so do not expect this, uh, this overview uh, systematic or comprehensive or anything. It's also not going to be sufficient for you to uh, to learn the topic in depth. I am, however, going to try to outline, first of all, the, how everything looks in a way, and second, uh, going to give some pointers. This is also why I welcome any questions during the session. And now finally, tomorrow, uh, I am going to continue in the, uh, in the, um, continue with the, quantum transport simulations. Uh, and that, that sections I do intend to spend more time just live coding. So, uh, so uh, I, here I also invite, um, invite input from you. Uh, is there something specific that you would like to know about and uh, that you would want to, uh, you would want to see? Um, I am, I, um, I cannot promise that I can set up a complete simulation and solve your problem for you, but you know there's a there's some room for uh, what I can do, and I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, all right, now uh, almost ready with the beginning, but before we I actually go into my runs, let me also introduce uh, some things about me. Well, uh, as you probably saw on the school website, I am a uh, theorist working at TU Delft. I am a uh, member of the Quantum Tinkerer group that happened to be a, uh, 
a uh, combination of two words, one of which being quantum that was not yet occupied. Uh, we would be quantum hackers, uh, but there are too many of those by now. Uh, so quite a bit of my personal work was uh, uh, on Maya Ranas. And um, I think I, over years I've touched several aspects of these. Uh, create, how, how do we create Maranas? How do we uh, detect them in a, uh, in a reliable way? And uh, I, think, I think something that's uh, perhaps most interesting is how do we use Maranas for quantum computation? Uh, through this, I also touch the topics of topological materials, although certainly not as deep as uh, many of the speakers at uh, this school and hybrid superconductivity. Um, some time ago, I, uh, together with uh, a few colleagues, I uh, authored uh, a, uh, an online course on topology and condensed matter. I'm not sure if you, if you saw it before, but uh, uh, recently I have refreshed it, uh, went through the code and the website design. So uh, it may, you may find it useful as a, as a reference. Uh, now, throughout my academic track, I ended up uh, working on software quite a bit and, uh, and uh, perhaps two of, uh, of the outputs that I consider, consider most important are the Quante package for uh, quantum transport simulations. And there is another package uh, adaptive uh, for sampling, uh, sampling uh, for adaptively sampling functions. I'm happy to talk about these as well. Well, uh, to Quant, I will obviously dedicate quite a bit of effort. Uh, recently, also with a bunch of people, uh, I started uh, the virtualscienceforum.org. And that is an uh, online organization for hosting um, any kind of online scientific presentations. Uh, in particular, something that may be relevant to you and uh, something that uh, an, an event where I invite all of you to participate is the speaker's corner. That's a, a series of online seminars uh, where everybody is welcome to give a talk. So as soon as you have a, a preprint on archive, uh, uh, you, can, you can sign up, give a talk. Uh, this will be of course announced to the mailing list subscribers. And, and of course you should also invite your, your friends and colleagues to listen to your talk. But uh, I think it's a, uh, it, for me uh, as a participant, as a member of audience, it has been a useful way to learn about recent works of what is happening in the community. And also, uh, also through this work, I have grown to, to appreciate open science, anything that is related to the publication of data, code, new formats of uh, publication and everything else. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit of an extended introduction. Uh, so if you have any questions about these topics, do reach out. Uh, but with that out of the way, let's begin with the Myronas. So uh, now I uh, have checked the previous lectures. And, uh, and so far, let me, let me see if I understand correctly. But I believe uh, this is what you had uh, already before. So I do think you have learned quite a bit about all the various topological phases and topological invariants. So, so uh, this I think it has been covered by most, not, not all, but most of the speakers. You had quantum hole, you had Chur numbers, Vernier centers, uh, fragile phases, all the zoo of the, of the topology. Now you also, and I think I think I think you didn't have a dedicated introduction to the topic, uh, but I believe yesterday you had a short uh, mention of Majoranas and Kitaev chains. So uh, and uh, that was I think in the in the talk of Christiane Marie Smith, uh, and you also had a uh, discussion of anions in particular in fractional quantum whole state. Uh, now, 
my focus now is going to be my runners. These are uh, the simplest non-abelian anions. And um, I think if, if, I, if I were to summarize not quite everything that's happening to my runners, but uh, most of the relevant, um, most of the relevant uh, topics in the Myrana research, I would say there are these uh, fall into three broad categories. One is um, uh, how to use Myrana's for quantum computation. And there are good reasons why, why this is a meaningful question. I'll get to that later. Um, then actually, even before uh, using something, you should want to create it. And uh, that's another uh, broad direction of research. How do we design my runs? And then uh, this one is perhaps a, a little bit more surprising, uh, at least initially, is um, let's say we made my runs. Uh, how, do we even, how do we even tell whether they are there? Um, so let's start. Now, uh, here is the short summary of the Majorana theory in one slide. So first of all, uh, my, the Majoranas and, uh, uh, come in two flavors. There are the Majorana fermions. These are the particles predicted to exist by a Tore Majorana in the... Uh, 30s before his mysterious disappearance, and it is hypothesized that a neutrino is a uh, Majorana fermion. So Majorana fermions are uh, are fermions where the, uh, uh, which which have a single flavor. So in other words, uh, creation uh, they form a single branch of a dispersion relation. Creation and annihilation uh, are are occupying the same branch. Essentially, uh, while uh, like like with many uh, like with many concepts in uh, high energy physics, uh, something fancy for high energy physicists, a Majorana fermion um, is actually relatively mundane in condensed matter. In particular, any kind of uh, quasi particle in a superconductor turns out to be the usual Majorana fermion. Now, the uh, the things that the, the, the things that catch much more attention than Majorana fermions are uh, the Majorana bound states or Majorana zero modes. So these are not fermions. They satisfy two thirds of the fermionic anti-commutation relations, which, which basically is as good as, uh, as none. So they, they are not fermions. They are uh, non-abelian anions. And their defining property is uh, that they are equal to their own antiparticles. So if gamma is, a, uh, is an annihilation operator of a Majorana, not Fermi, a Majorana particle, then gamma dagger is equal to gamma. Creating and annihilating a Majorana is the same thing. Now that seems like a uh, really silly particle to use, but, uh, or a really silly concept to introduce. Uh, but first of all, with a little bit of math, we can realize that, that uh, while it, the particle seems rather unusual, um, it's not so mysterious. And in particular, if we take a regular fermionic operator C, uh, we can easily decompose it into two Majoranas. Uh, gamma one plus uh, I think this should be a square root. Uh, gamma one plus i gamma two, uh, and this should be a uh, minus. Apologies. Quick fix. Minus and square root. All right. Much better. So, uh, so a Majorana operator is like a. Uh, there are different ways to view this identity. You could say uh, gamma one is like a real part of a of a complex fermion operator, and gamma two is like an imaginary part. You could also view it as a sort of uh, pi over four rotation in the complex plane. 
uh, but but at least it's uh, it's clear that uh, that um, two Majorana so so every fermion can be decomposed into two Majorana uh, operators, any neutral fermion really, um, and uh, that's uh, that suggests uh, also a pathway to uh, to create them. Uh, if we were somehow to create a uh, to uh, to separate a uh, single fermionic operator into two parts and uh, isolate them in space, we would create uh, we would create isolated Majorana modes. And now here comes the interesting thing: if uh, the only operator that you have is uh, gamma, there is uh, there is exactly. Uh, exactly one Hamiltonian, one physically sound Hamiltonian that you can make out of these, that's uh, uh, gamma, gamma dagger, any other combination is the same, but gamma uh, equals to gamma dagger and gamma also squares to identity. So uh, really there is, a, there is no uh, local Hilbert space associated with a, uh, with a single Marana operator. Which means if I have multiple Majoranas, then all the degrees of freedom are non-local, and uh, um, any local perturbation uh, will not change the change the state of the wave function. That was first realized by Kitaev uh, in uh, in the seminal work quite a while ago. Now. Just protecting a, a degree, a quantum degree of freedom from the environment is uh, already rather interesting. There's uh, these are uh, these are these are useful since uh, noise is is one of the main problems that that, that uh, quantum computers have to deal with. But there's a there's another interesting property of Majoranas, namely, uh, let me try to draw. So if I take four Majoranas. Uh, I could pair them like this so that they create uh, and call this uh, particle C1, this particle C2. Uh, but I could also exchange them without bringing them close to each other. And I could end up with a different combination of Majoranas. Now, uh, we do know that uh, physically, since I did not uh, make any degrees of freedom touch, uh, the original fermionic degree of freedom is now stored not in uh, these two Majoranas, but in these two Majoranas. Likewise, uh, the fermionic degree of freedom that was stored in these two Majoranas is now stored in the other two Majoranas. Turns out, if, uh, if you apply this constraint, there's uh, or, or in other words, if you just apply the definition of the of the different operators, you figured out that if you take the many body wave function, turns out that you applied a, a discrete unitary transformation to it. So, in other words, you have applied a rotation. Now, that is actually exciting news because now we know that we have uh, protected degrees of freedom. And we have a uh, digital way to manipulate them. So, so if we take Majoranas, we we can uh, apply uh, an exchange, and the many-body wave function transforms in a non-trivial way. That is great. That uh, if if we if we are interested in making a quantum computer, and uh, because they're cool, we of course are. That means we have really useful building blocks for this. Uh, so now the complications or uh, the the details that appear are the questions that arise if we say, all right, Majoranas are really good for quantum computation, but can we actually make a quantum computer from it? Uh, and uh, we of course don't want to make any random quantum computer. We want to make use. Uh, we want to make use uh, the the nice properties of Majoranas. Um, now, people, since the topic is quite mature, uh, people know how what are the necessary ingredients to make a protected quantum computer. And actually, quite broadly, regardless of the platform, it all boils down to the same collection of uh, operations. First of all, one needs uh, one needs 
um, to have protected degrees of freedom that are sufficiently robust against noise. Um, let's imagine in our idealized scenario when we already do have uh, Majoranas, we have done this. Uh, now, uh, furthermore, uh, of course, we don't uh, we don't just need uh, the protected degrees of freedom. We also want to make uh, protected gates. Now, uh, that is a bit more complicated because not all the gates are protected. Turns out, uh, no matter what kind of braiding sequence one implements in uh, Majoranas, there's only uh, there's only a handful of uh, unitary rotations and one, that one can implement uh, with uh, with these particles. So, uh, in quite broadly, people mainly know one framework, which is a uh, 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 Clifford Gates and uh, Magic State Distillation, the uh, a protocol. And the idea is that we we implement discrete rotations by pi over uh, four degrees uh, of all the single qubit and one qubit operators. Uh, and we also need a single gate, which is unprotected. Uh, that, is, uh, that is used to prepare a so-called magic state that is sufficient to make, uh, to make uh, a quantum computer universal. But it is, uh, but there, there is some fundamental reason why you cannot make uh, all the operations protected. So uh, what people do is they run error corrections on the noise, uh, what amounts to essentially error correction on this noisy operation and uh, apply the magic state distillation protocol. Once all of these ingredients are in place, you can make a Marana quantum computer. With that, I see a question. Uh, uh, sometimes you hear people talk about topological qubits. Is that the same name uh, as uh, the protected degrees of freedom or is that something else? Uh, that is correct. Uh, protected degrees of freedom formed by Majoranas um, are uh, what uh, in other context is known as a logical qubit. So this is uh, not a hard, not a noisy hardware degree of freedom, but it is if everything works well, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a uh, binary degree of freedom, quantum binary degree of freedom with no noise. Now let's see how this uh, checklist transforms into uh, Majoranas. And here comes uh, a problem that historically uh, people working on Majoranas didn't realize for quite a while. So first of all, and that's something which we already know, uh, Majoranas are almost fermions. So a single Majorana is, uh, is so different Majorana operators anti-commute, or in other words, out of every two Majoranas, you can make a single fermion. Uh, and turns out, uh, if you have uh, non-interacting fermions, so if only operators that you have are uh, at maximally uh, at maximum contain two fermionic operators, so they are all quadratic, not more. Uh, then uh, a classical computer can efficiently simulate such a circuit. In other words, even if we break the topological protection, bring Majoranas close together, let them interact, uh, they will still stay non-interacting fermions effectively, special, but non-interacting. And that means there is uh, no way to, uh, to uh, implement a quantum computer uh, using non-interacting Majoranas. That's a problem. That's where uh, interactions come in. Uh, so the, the main insight about how to make Majoranas interact was, uh, was uh, the main idea was realized by Liang Fu in the paper uh, that spe speaks about electron teleportation. But in hindsight, uh, the, the, key new, uh, the key new idea is uh, is that uh, while we've been focusing on keeping track of the fermions, every single particle that we have that we are dealing with, so electrons, they have charge. Now the electric, so so uh, the superconductor is originally composed of electrons, and the electron charge has to go somewhere. We know that the fermion parity 
forms the protected degrees of, degree of freedom and goes into the superconductor. However, electron charge should also go somewhere. And uh, this is where uh, Liang has realized that uh, the superconducting charge enters the superconducting condensate. Now, it turns out that uh, measuring the overall charge of a finite piece of a superconductor is a uh, relatively standard uh, action or procedure in uh, superconducting circuits. So this, uh, this uh, uh, I think, to the best of my understanding, opens the only uh, possibility for uh, using uh, for using Majoranas with quantum computing. Namely, what we want to create Majoranas. We want to be able to somehow break them, but we also want to put multiple Majoranas. And uh, if you remember what I what I said about. Uh, uh, by linear operators, we want to have more than two Majoranas on a single piece of a superconductor with Coulomb energy, uh, which is thankfully a relatively standard uh, standard quantum device. And uh, by using these building blocks and by measuring charging energy or uh, through it the fermion parity, turns out we can work out the full uh, scheme for a Majorana quantum computation. I will not have time to go into details, but there are a couple of uh, couple of uh, ideas of how to make these. Um, these mostly rely on some kind of superconducting islands connecting Majoranas. So there are tiny Majoranas here. There are the superconducting devices. It's uh, it's a little bit too long to explain, but but this is the main principle. So uh, so. You, that answers the first question. In order to make Majoranas, we, uh, in order to make Majoranas with a quantum computer, we need to combine them with charging energy, and this will result in uh, in us creating a quantum computer, a protected one. Now, whether it works or not, of course, uh, relies on an important uh, on an important thing. How do we make Majoranas? And here, the situation is complicated. There are all the basic ingredients. There's the uh, superconductivity uh, that is required, depending on your view, uh, to mask the charge degree of freedom or to couple uh, the electronic creation and annihilation operators together. But this is an absolute requirement. One needs to break down fermion number conservation to a uh, fermion parity conservation. So there needs to be a process that adds two fermions to a condensate, and that essentially amounts to a superconductor. Um, additionally, Majoranas need to be isolated. Uh, and in context of fermions, it, need, it means that uh, one needs to break time reversal symmetry, since otherwise Kramer's degeneracy will ensure that every degree of freedom is doubled by uh, due, to, due to the uh, fermions having half, a, a half integer spin. Uh, and also one needs to break spin rotation symmetry uh, by any of the means like adding spin orbit coupling or uh, Zeeman splitting or, or anything else. Now, most importantly, uh, even with that at hand, one, needs, uh, one still needs to work out a specific system and that turns out to be hard. There are many possible pathways to creating Majoranas and uh, one basic one is taking a semiconducting nanowire, adding a uh, superconductor next to it, uh, so that the superconductor induces superconductivity in a nanowire, adding magnetic field, tuning the parameters, that's the hard part, and hoping that they appear. Uh, I, see, I see a question about spin liquids and uh, that their uh, ground state uh, being described by Majoranas, but that's not superconducting. Uh, that is true. Uh, so, uh, the, so, so Majoranas may appear in other systems as an emergent degree of freedom. Uh, so I am focusing on proposals that use uh, electrons as the source of the fermion parity. There are, uh, there are other scenarios uh, uh, but first of all, these are, uh, I mean, even, even uh, error correcting codes can be transformed to implement Majorana operators. Uh, 
Uh, but these are this this is quite an orthogonal approach, so I'm not probably going to go into details on that one. But but indeed you are right that uh, the Majorana operators or Majorana degree of freedom uh, degrees of freedom also appear in other contexts. Uh, now uh, another uh, another platform that that has been around for a bit less than nanowires, but uh, recently gained uh, a renewed uh, traction is uh, is uh, atomic chains. This is when uh, one takes a surface of a superconductor, puts a, an array of magnetic atoms on top of it. And here, I think it's fair to say that one hopes that uh, the magnetic atoms are just right uh, so, that, uh, so that a Majorana appears. Uh, this system is, uh, there, there, are there are really beautiful experiments uh, uh, done, published, I think this spring, uh, but but I think it's fair to say that there is still no definite uh, definite platform here that clearly supports Maranas, even though there is a lot of recent progress. The same is true really about all of the proposals. But okay. Um, so another option uh, that I should mention is uh, the topological insulator. So if we have a topological insulator, we put a superconductor on its surface, and we put a vortex. This uh, this system is nice. Uh, one one really doesn't shouldn't need to tune it. The surface uh, the, the the superconducting vortex should have a, an isolated Majorana. Uh, now turns out super topological insulators are not easy materials to deal with, and uh, superconducting vortices have normal cores that introduce additional states. So so experimentally, this proposal has its own difficulties. Finally, I should also mention uh, planar structures where one uh, creates a pathway between two superconductors. Uh, these two superconductors then form a Josephson junction uh, and one applies magnetic field uh, that, uh, that breaks the time reversal symmetry and creates the Majoranas. Conceptually, this is very similar to a uh, nanowire proposal, but there's an additional tuning parameter and that is the superconducting phase difference, which turns out to be quite beneficial. Uh, so now one caveat, and that's something that you should uh, take out probably from my talk um, as a uh, uh, to uh, as a as as a as a way to read the literature. Uh, not all of the platforms that I listed uh, are suitable for quantum computation, in particular because one needs to isolate Majoranas in order to for charging energy to only act on a handful. In particular, the atomic chains are, are pinned uh, on top of a superconductor and there's no way to isolate two different atomic chains or same applies to this proposal. Um, another problem which uh, uh, is that uh, technically all the ingredients are there and with modern fabrication capacity, it's possible and even easy enough to technically combine all ingredients. One take, can take a... Uh, a topological insulator slap a superconductor on top, it will look correct. The problem is that it turns out that there's a lot of physics behind these and it's actually very hard to make things work. In addition to just the basic physics of different parameters that one needs to control, there's disorder, imperfections in the systems, uh, there's uh, a universal problem as the competition between time reversal symmetry breaking and superconductivity. And finally, there's a length scale mismatch. This one, this one is, uh, is really tricky and easy to forget if you're dealing with toy models, but uh, superconductors are all metals. They have a Fermi wavelength of, uh, of nanometer stops or even shorter. Uh, at the same time, Majoranas are single states. So if we have to create an isolated state uh, and we somehow have to deal with the Fermi wavelength of uh, nanometers. That means we have we need really precise engineering because it's uh, like let's say if we make a place for a state to rest, uh, and there are a few Fermi wavelengths fitting into that region, then then we don't just create Marana, but also a few normal fermions that complicate everything. 
So this uh, this uh, extra difficulty is, uh, I think, one of the ops one of the open challenges in the field. And then finally, uh, let's say you have done all of these. Uh, there's still a question of how you, how do you know that you did make Majoranas, and that's also a uh, question with no easy answer. So let's discuss how to detect Majoranas. So the first obvious strategy is uh, just uh, go for it. Take Majoranas, they need to braid to something non-trivial. Uh, make Majoranas, implement braiding. If, uh, if it works, you're good to go. Now, that's technical, that's definitely the correct, uh, the, the reasoning here is correct. But first of all, braiding requires time-dependent manipulation. Uh, it requires many ingredients at once. Uh, and therefore, it presents additional challenges. Additionally, uh, uh, it either works or it doesn't. And unfortunately, if it doesn't work, you don't know what's gone wrong. So braiding also leaves no room for debugging and figuring out which of the material platform uh, has gone, uh, didn't work. So an alternative is uh, to measure the supercurrent. And this is, uh, this is a caricature image. So if I bring two Maranas close together, and, I, uh, and let's, say, let's, say, uh, let's think about how they should work. If I modify a phase of one of the Maranas so that it acquires an overall minus sign. This turns out exchanges a fermionic annihilation operator into a fermionic creation operator. Or in other words, it... Um, it, uh, it uh, creates a fermion out of nowhere. So if, uh, if a fermionic state formed by these two maranas was empty, it now becomes filled. First of all, that's quite, uh, quite counterintuitive. We have created a single fermion out of nowhere. That's why this, this process is called the fermion parity anomaly. But second, it has a clear signature. We, uh, we advance the phase difference between Majoranas by, uh, by H over E, the flux quantum. Uh, and uh, nothing should change. But if we advance the phase by a superconducting flux quantum, we should create a different state. As a result, the supercurrent acquires an anomalous periodicity uh, with a, uh, this is also known as a four pi periodic Josephson effect. That's the alternative strategy for uh, dealing with, uh, for detecting Majoranas. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, really fragile. Uh, turns out this is a transient signature and one needs to be neither too fast nor too slow. And also a mundane Aron of Bohm effect has the exact same periodicity that further complicates uh, the detection of Majoranas. Now, a final, uh, a final approach is, uh, is perhaps the simplest conceptually, but also the, uh, the most, uh, it's definitely the most popular by the amount of uh, publications. And the idea is uh, to, up, to hook up wires to a device and try to send current through a Majorana mode. Now, Turns out, and this is something that should relate to some of your prior knowledge, uh, the topological invariance of whether the wire is in a trivial or in a topological phase, or in other words, whether it has Majoranas or not, uh, relates one-to-one -to, -one to the determinant of the reflection matrix from the edge. Uh, through that me mechanism, uh, there is a unique signature of Majoranas, namely, uh, Namely, if there's a, uh, uh, there should be a, uh, a tunneling anomaly of, uh, with a quantized conductance at zero energy. So that forms, uh, that forms uh, yet another approach to measure Majoranas, that is uh, to observe a quantized zero bias peak at zero energy. Still has caveats though. Um, First of all, if you remember, uh, Majoranas do need to, uh, or any topological phase needs to have a gap. And uh, experiments that do measure tunneling conductance also can probe the gap. And turns out none of the experimental platforms so far have an observable gap. There's another, uh, uh, even uh, another uh, problem, which is, uh, 
which is unfortunately uh, unfortunately complicating the interpretation of published results. Namely, if I if I have enough parameters and if I tune the device hard enough, everything I will eventually get a quantized conductance somewhere. So it shouldn't just be quantized; it should be it should look correct. And so far, I don't think any anyone demonstrated uh, demonstrated. Uh, the Majorana signatures in a systematic way so that one could conclude indeed that that the zero bias peak is due to Majoranas. Now this is a, a matter of speculation but uh, the possible way out for this is, uh, is combining multiple checks and characterizations of the system. So, so I think one needs to one needs to probe uh, the superconducting gap, vary the parameters, vary non-local conductance. And uh, one needs to decompose the system into basic building blocks so that we, so that we understand uh, the system rather well. Here, I also want to, want to praise uh, this group. And here, I think the main people pushing this work were Dima Pikulin and Bernard van Heck, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not completely sure about that. So they tried to design a, uh, an automated protocol uh, which would measure the data and try to identify whether there are Majoranas or not uh, with, without any human input by, uh, by taking a large amount of data and processing, uh, processing it uh, in an automated way, manner. So do check it out. With that, I think uh, I have run quite a bit over time, but I think I should conclude the part one. So first of all, I explained uh, how to use Majoranas to create a protected quantum computer. I explained, and I'm happy to go into more detail uh, into how to create Majoranas in different material platforms. And I also discussed a bit how to uh, how to create and uh, and manipulate, uh, how to detect Majoranas if you assume they are there in your system. Uh, which, uh, which brings me to the final part. Uh, I think we should dedicate a couple of minutes for questions. Do you have any? What is the protocol uh, uh, to identify Majoranas using non-local trans? Ah, that's a uh, that's a I, I love this topic in particular because I really thought a lot about it. Uh, so let me outline the basic idea. So let's say I have a, some system, and usually it has a superconductor next to it. This is a normal part. I have uh, one electrode here, another electrode here. So the idea of non-local transport Sorry, is to like, like I'm afraid that we, we cannot see what you drop. Oh, uh, that is unfortunate. Uh, let's see. Maybe that's because. How about now? No. Still not? No, still not. Ah, all right. Well, uh, that's too bad. Uh, that means I'll need to use words. Um, so the idea is uh, to try and send. So so to try and send the current. Uh, from one normal electrode in the device to the opposite end. And um, now this sounds like something incredibly stupid because there's of course superconductor and the two ends are effectively shorted. Uh, but if one additionally grounds the superconductor, then um, the superconductor absorbs all, uh, so, so the superconductor absorbs all of the supercurrent because that one is grounded. Uh, and the remaining current that may go through is due to the non-equilibrium quasiparticles. So whether you see it on local transport or not depends on whether the quasiparticles can go through the entirety of the system. Now that in turn means that you can uh, that now all of a sudden you have a tool to detect a uh, a uh, topological transition, because that one, at least one of the required uh, parameters of the topological transition is that the uh, gap in the system must close and then reopen. So non-local transport is a tool to see this process. So that's, uh, that's the gist of the idea. Um, 
How do Majoranos compare to other types of topological quantum computation? Are Majoranos the easiest option? Well, uh, that's a great question. And uh, once we have a topological quantum computer, I'll tell you the answer. Um, so conceptually, um, first of all, a lot of quantum computing revolves around the same set of ideas. So conceptually, Majoranas are not very, so the type of error correction processing that one needs to do with Majoranas is not very different from what one would do with a with a much more standard surface code. There is the hope of my runners that uh, the starting point would be more suitable to implement the operations required both for error correction and uh, and state distillation because uh, my runners have some part of error correction encoded. There's also there's another also another peculiarity which is not quite a deal breaker but uh, because Majoranas are fermion fermions uh, one can try to use Majoranas as a digitized fermionic degrees of freedom. Now in the conventional quantum computing it does not play a big role but if uh, your goal with uh, quantum is quantum simulation of physical systems, and in particular, an important application of quantum computing is quantum chemistry. Uh, that means that uh, that uh, that means uh, that you basically lose the overhead. Usually, you would need to convert uh, fermionic operators; th these are electrons, to qubits because you because you only have cube, uh, um, protected qubits and then do manipulation on those. Majorana is allowed to directly implement protected fermions. So that's, uh, now that doesn't make things necessarily easier, but this allows to remove, let's say, the, another layer between what you want to do and what you can do physically. Uh, there are also more exotic models of quantum computation. Um, there's the, there's the boson encodings like uh, cat states. Uh, like a lot of the, a lot of the math is clo super closely related to Majorana's actually, and I think uh, uh, I, I'm not an expert on on all of these topics, but I think there's a general theme of quantum computing that has different but closely related manifestations. Uh, there are, of course, many non Majorana codes. There's, there, there are uh, more exotic non abelian anions. So these are, uh, these are uh, quite different from Majoranas. And so there's, there's also a broader field. But, but the basic approach is start with Clifford gates and, uh, and uh, effectively Majorana operators. Uh, all right, I see that I did run quite a bit over time. Um, so at this point, I propose we make a break until half an hour. That's uh, seven minutes. After that, I'm going to give a, uh, an introduction into what quantum transport is, but I'm not going to, uh, to do a live demonstration yet. I will postpone that until tomorrow. Then. So uh, let's take a break. I'm uh, going to stop the screen share and I'll see you all in a few minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, that, that's perfect. Um, so what time? Um, yeah, five... uh, at half. Okay, five minutes, okay. So we are back in, in five, six minutes, okay.
All right. Hello, everyone. And don't go. Yeah. Go All right. So we're back. I hope everyone is back. All right. Um, so so now, as I uh, as I explained, uh, this is this is quite a different topic. Uh, and that's uh, that's related to the so so that relate that is related to the tools uh, that you need in order to understand what is happening with in a uh, in any mesoscopic device. In my I, I uh, frequently apply this to my runners, but uh, there are many different systems where uh, transport tells you quite a bit of things. Uh, so. Today I will first uh, introduce uh, introduce the the main concepts and how uh, and what what happens under the hood. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to demonstrate uh, demonstrate how to use uh, quant uh, to to simulate topological systems, in particular focusing on Majoranas and uh, and topological oscillators. Uh, but for now, let's uh, let's discuss transport and uh, and uh, and uh, mesoscopic devices. So usually, when we are talking about a uh, a uh, when we want to simulate a system, we either want to simulate a bulk response of a material, in which case the band structure and say things like Kubo formula are uh, are the go-to tools. Or if it's a metal, then it's uh, then it's semi-classical transport and things like Boltzmann equation. Uh, but if we're interested in uh, isolated electronic states, we are usually talking about small devices where geometry happens to play a role, and this is uh, one example of such device. So. Uh, Quite broadly, if we want to do numerics, we need to, dis to deal with deg discrete degrees of freedom. So we introduce a tight binding model that corresponds to the Hamiltonian of interest. I'm sure many of you have seen tight binding models before, but uh, uh, transport is, uh, is, uh, has an, uh, is a tight binding model with a twist. Namely, namely, we usually want to deal with open system, which means we have a finite scattering region to which leads are attached and the leads have translation invariants. Um, now, instead of a finite system, we have an infinite system and uh, we usually want to, we usually imagine electrons coming from one lead and scattering into different leads. So we need to get conductance and other observables. So to figure out how the electrons go through this geometry. And the typical folklore that you probably still hear in the field uh, or uh, um, uh, certainly, certainly this was how I learned the topics uh, is that you need to compute the lead self energy the retarded Green's function of the system, the lesser Green's function, and then from that you get all the derivatives of all the observables. Uh, however, there is a, uh, I think there is a uh, really straightforward and systematic definition of what we are doing. And that uh, it appeals to me because we are just writing down equations. So I'm going to walk you through the concept. Let's uh, take a look at the problem again. So this is uh, the tight binding system we, that we are solving. And the first thing which we want to do uh, when dealing with the tight binding system is write down, or with any system, is write down the equations that we are solving. So we have a finite scattering region. Let's say uh, that one has a, a, a Hamiltonian HSS standing for the scattering region. Uh, the leads are all translational invariant, so they are in, they have infinitely repeated Hamiltonians with different unit cells, and then different unit cells of the leads are connected by hoppings. So there's there's a, our full Hamiltonian of this infinite system is this large matrix that has a scattering has scattering region as one of its block blocks, and a large block tri diag and an infinitely long block tri diagonal. Uh, matrix corresponding to all the leads. The wave function of the system is the wave function in the scattering region. 
plus uh, plus infinitely many technically weight functions uh, in the system. And now, if we're dealing with a, with a uh, with fermions, we need to fill out all the states up to a certain energy, and that's how that's how we obtain the full solution. Um, now, importantly, uh, of course, solving an infinite problem is not great. Uh, so usually, we want to reduce it to a finite problem. And uh, here, this should not come as a surprise. Uh, since the leads are infinite and translational invariant, we want to rely on the translation invariants. So uh, we decompose the wave function and the leads into a superposition uh, of, uh, of a wave function in one unit cell times some uh, uh, times a, an exponential factor. This is mostly like a plane wave. Except uh, we cannot quite apply Bloch's theorem because our system is uh, each lead is only half infinite. So the wave functions in different unit cells are still uh, related, but we cannot we cannot use the full translation invariant. So we are searching for all the solutions in the lead that uh, that have this form. Uh, now, once we substitute the uh, this uh, this ansatz for the wave function in the, into the tag binding equations for the lead, we obtain a, uh, a, a, a an eigenvalue a quadratic eigenvalue problem uh, where lambda the translation eigenvector is the eigenvalue and psi naught the wave function in the unit cell is the unknown. This is uh, this is relatively standard, but of course now there is a uh, a difference. Namely, if we had pure translation invariants, we would be dealing with normalizable modes. So lambda would be a uh, purely complex exponent. Here we cannot do so. Uh, polynomial eigenproblems. I'm not sure if you, if you have encountered those in in your uh, in your research or in your work or not. But these are all uh, map, mapped rather straightforwardly on conventional eigenproblems by uh, by introducing auxiliary degrees of freedom. So, so we can rewrite this quadratic eigen problem in a more conventional form where the degrees of freedom are doubled and the matrix that we need to diagonalize being larger. This matrix observe is also non-Hermitian and, uh, and, not, and uh, not always well-defined. So there's a more complicated algorithm, which is actually quite a bit of math, but turns out this part uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can rewrite uh, to obtain exactly the same solutions, but uh, but uh, in a way that exists regardless of whether any of the matrices is invertible. So so this brings this brings us to a much longer form, uh, but uh, on the good side it's more stable here. Uh, here, the different matrices are the decomposition of the hoppings between different unit cells of the leads, and um, and the Hamiltonian uh, has an extra extra complex term that always makes it invertible. So, uh, so as a reminder, we are, our goal here is to solve the, this infinitely large system of tight binding equations for uh, for the scattering problem. This is what we need to obviously need to compute all the observables. Uh, and uh, so far, what we've done is we have enumerated the solutions in the leads. Now, turns out uh, all of these solutions are, uh, are, uh, are exponential waves, uh, but they, are of they come in different types. So all the waves, uh, all the waves that we are interested in uh, can so first of all there may be uh, plane waves where the uh, absolute value of the eigenvalue is uh, purely uh, is equal to one. These are propagating modes. These correspond to the particles either incoming from the infinity or scattering into the infinity. Uh, these are the ones the, the states that carry current. Uh, we can group the solutions of the eigen problems. Uh, we can isolate these in in the solutions of the eigen problem by taking uh, by computing the expectation value of the current operator, 
and also normalizing each mode to carry a unit current. Uh, so I described we have uh, outgoing modes uh, and, uh, and incoming modes. There are also modes that are not normalizable. Uh, and these are, or th sorry, that are not propagating waves. Uh, these are evanescent and uh, there, uh, 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 the, these have a, uh, an absolute value of the eigenvalue smaller than one, so they, they uh, become exponentially small away from the scattering region. They're not extremely interesting to study, but we do need these, uh, these solutions in order to solve the tight binding systems system, otherwise it becomes underdetermined. So uh, observe, we, we basically didn't do anything, anything profound here. We started with a definition of a problem. We are basically writing down its solution and solving it step by step. So having all of the modes of the, of the eigen problem, we can substitute them into the infinitely many tight binding equations that we had with the advantage being that uh, all of the equations corresponding to the lead uh, are uh, now are, uh, these, these are, these equations are all automatically satisfied. The only equations that are not automatically satisfied are the, one, are the ones that uh, contain the wave function of the scattering region. So here are the two remaining equations. These contain the wave function in the scattering region, and uh, the scattering matrix that tells us how the uh, amplitudes of the incoming modes, uh, outgoing modes relate to the amplitudes of the incoming modes. So uh, that brings the exact, the, the, that, that is uh, the definition of the scattering problem. Uh, we set, uh, we define a linear system with the boundary condition corresponding to us sending current through one of the uh, leads or through one of the modes in the lead, we, um, we find all the modes and we figure out what are the amplitudes of the current. In other words, uh, we are able to compute how electrons scatter through this general scattering region. And of course, uh, some of these could be boring, some of these could be really interesting uh, and uh, teach us about the physics in our device. Um, all right, uh, so this formulation, and that's uh, for those of you who have encountered uh, recursive Green's functions and, uh, and, and the, and the uh, older sources introducing quantum transport, this approach is equivalent to, so if we eliminate the degrees of freedom corresponding to the scattering matrix, we end up uh, with an extra correction to the Hamiltonian, and that is what is called the lead self-energy. The inverse of this matrix is then then becomes the Green's function. All right, so uh, this is uh, this is uh, now I have uh, broken down the physical problem that we want to solve to a system of equations, and this is a little bit of insight that uh, that will hopefully generalize beyond uh, beyond just the quantum transport problem and. Uh, just because linear systems of equations appear in many contexts. So uh, we end up with, with essentially needing to solve a linear system of equations, uh, but not just any linear system of equations, ours is really sparse. So let's say I, uh, I have a uh, scattering region, which looks like this. This is a neat little circle. Um, it has discrete sites. So if I were to write down as a, uh, as a uh, matrix, I would introduce uh, numbers to every degree of freedom, to every degree of freedom, and I would end up with a very large matrix. Uh, now, obviously, since uh, each site only has a few neighbors, uh, this matrix is sparse. So as you see over here, most of the matrix elements are zero. Um, now that's okay. Uh, that is something to keep in mind. Um, so let's try and solve this linear system of equations. And uh, um, 
as you probably know from, I still remember from, uh, from the linear algebra course, uh, in order to solve the linear system of equations, the, the direct and turns out the main approach is to apply uh, the so-called Gaussian elimination. This is when we take one equation, take one variable, express it through the rest, substitute it into the next equation, uh, go on like this until we end up with an equation for one variable. This, this process is called elimination. And then we undo, we, we compute the value of, of this last variable and we undo the elimination by substituting this expression back into all the earlier variables. Uh, and, uh, and we obtain the answer. So uh, if we have such a matrix, this is how a naive solution looks like. So, so here we are keeping track of the pattern of substitutions that we need to do. And uh, the problem that we are facing now is what is known as a fill-in. So if we start with the first row, indeed every, every single degree of freedom only involves a handful of other degrees of freedom. But as we continue, uh, we generate equations that relate more and more variables to one another until eventually we end up with a completely dense matrix where all variables are related to all the other variables. Or in other words, we cannot rely on the sparsity structure of this big matrix. And, um, and therefore we are facing a slowdown in the solution. So now uh, the, a somewhat better idea, this was a, an artificial example, a somewhat better idea. And this is what most of the people would do if they were to solve uh, the problem on their own is to reorder degrees of freedom in somehow a natural order so that uh, nearby degrees of freedom appear as with nearby numbers. So basically you could imagine I could go through, through these sites row by row and assign them numbers uh, like this. This creates a uh, different, uh, so this amounts to reordering of the degrees of freedom in the sparse matrix. And it creates a differently looking sparse matrix that has no uh, elements too far from the diagonal. Uh, this approach is also known in the literature as uh, recursive Green's functions. And the advantage is that now if I start eliminating the degrees of freedom, I end up uh, with uh, new matrix elements that only relate nearby, uh, nearby degrees of freedom. And therefore I gain a uh, speed up. Um, and this was the state of, a while, of, of the art for a while. Now, importantly, and uh, for me, it was largely a lesson in humility. Uh, a good idea if dealing with, with a mathematical problem is to look at what mathematicians do. Uh, turns out there's an even uh, more uh, smart rearrangement of the degrees of freedom uh, that is called the so-called nested dissection. So let's get back to it and, uh, and, uh, and let me explain what it means. So uh, we could separate uh, the system into two parts. Then we could separate each part into two parts and so on and so forth. So creating a tree of uh, binary separations. Turns out that such a, such a rearrangement creates a, an even more uh, sparse fill-in pattern and uh, saves uh, more time. Now, Turns out uh, that a difference uh, both in memory usage and in, uh, in time usage uh, can be like an order of magnitude. So, so this, is, uh, this is quite important. And uh, there are two lessons here, I think. Well, one is, uh, if one is how to solve sparse linear system of equations. But more broadly, uh, before you try to implement something, do try to check an alg if there's an algorithm doing so. And if there happens to be a team of mathematicians uh, uh, studying a topic and working on it as their main scope, it's unlikely that you are going to find something smarter. Now, that is to say that, uh, that it, it's not guaranteed to, uh, that you are not going to find something smarter. And there are interesting situations where physics intuition led to the development of new algorithms, but first you're better off checking it out. Uh, 
So this is, uh, this is the end of my uh, short introduction to quantum transport. So overall, I explained uh, the scope of the idea. So we first want to write, reduce our problem to a tight binding system of equations. Then we need to use the translation. If we are dealing with a scattering problem, we need to apply the translation variance in the leads that amounts to computing all the propagating and evanescent modes. We want to form a large sparse linear equation, system of large sparse linear equations, feed it to a matrix, uh, feed it to a uh, correct library and get the answer. This is essentially, now uh, that's, that's all Quan does. Uh, it provides tools to, uh, to solve uh, linear, uh, to formulate, to, to convert, physical uh, quantum transport problems into linear systems, solve and analyze the answers. Now, I really have a uh, uh, little time for today. So I uh, think it's not, not a great idea uh, for me to go now into a demonstration of how, how quant works. So perhaps it's good to use the remaining uh, time for questions, and these can also include questions. This can be questions about the, what I just told, but of course, I also welcome questions uh, about the uh, the previous part and um, any other questions about life, the universe, and everything. So, please. Uh, what kind of circuits do you build with the systems? Uh -huh. That's, um, uh, that is something that I uh, will also talk, uh, uh, talk more about tomorrow. Um, now, there's, uh, there's something to be said about the, um, let's say, landscape of, sim of, uh, of simulations of uh, quantum materials. Um, there is the there's the field, uh, there's the ab initio field where you need to deal with uh, typically a handful of atoms and you want to know uh, what kind of band structure uh, you obtain. That is, uh, that is um, uh, that there you care about Coulomb interactions, self-consistency, it's, uh, it's a gigantic field in its own right. And usually, uh, these are not the problems where uh, where quant can contribute uh, meaningfully. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's there's a completely different uh, field where uh, where you don't care about uh, single electronic states, and you care about macroscopic response of the material. So uh, so say you you could consider uh, a uh, how electrons flow through a piece of metal. A piece of metal contains, uh, contains even, even a micron-sized uh, piece of metal contains, uh, contains billions of electrons or more. I think it's about uh, a bit more. Uh, and, uh, and there, even, even any kind of efficient library will not make a difference. You want a completely different quasi-classical approach then. Uh, now, uh, this kind of tight binding simulation is relevant in the context when you're when you have a system where you, on the one hand, uh, care about uh, about individual degree of freedom degrees of freedom. So you care about uh, physics of the Fermi wavelength, but you don't have. A, but also you care about the geometry. So 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 these simulations are relevant sort of at an intermediate scale between macroscopic systems and uh, atomic systems. Uh, to give a typical scale, uh, a, a typical simulation of a fog. Uh, so so typically we simulate devices that are anywhere between uh, let's say hundred nanometers and a few microns. These also happen to be uh, relevant to a range of experiments. All right. Uh, yes, uh, let's move on with the questions. Do you have any comment about precision in large scattering regions or large number number of degrees of degrees of freedom in general? Oof, that's a that's a really good question, and um, I think in general the answer is no. Um, 
um, you, you're right that uh, there is one part that I did completely skip, and that is ensuring that the equations that I start from are meaningful and correspond to the physical system. Uh, now, um, that unfortunately, I mean, there's only one way to do so. Uh, and uh, that way is to know what kind of physics is relevant and iterate uh, on your knowledge and understanding compared with experimental results, etc. Uh, there is no foolproof guarantee that your simulation is accurate. You can be, if you have a specific phenomenon in mind, you can be reasonably sure that you are capturing the relevant physics. But you never know which physics is relevant. And moreover, some physical phenomena are, uh, uh, are so much more pain to simulate than, than the simple scattering problem um, that, that you have to also rely on the intuition quite a bit. Uh, next question. Did you find Python's performance to be a problem compared to a compiled language like a CPP or a Julia? Well, uh, Quant is a little bit uh, older than Julia, but the short answer is no, uh, because the main part of work is actually done by uh, by uh, by Fortran, and that's either either the linear dense linear algebra like Layback or uh, sparse linear algebra. Uh, we are using the MUMP solver. That one also happens to be uh, done in Fortran. But in short, of course, all the all the numerically intense parts are uh, are implemented in a different language, uh, and otherwise there's a big domain of how to how to uh, implement efficient code in Python, which is a topic of uh, of a separate discussion. Uh, and performance is of course important, but for this type of problem, Python does not play a big role or does not introduce a big slowdown. All right, Marana particles that are suitable for quantum computation require strong uh, interaction. Is there a way of, to formulate quantum computing with non-interacting topology like a churn insulator? Also, uh, once again, the uh, problem here is if you are starting with fermions, then there is a universal uh, no-go theorem. No matter what you do with uh, non-interacting fermions, it's, uh, it's going to be efficiently simulatable on a classical computer. Efficiently in terms of uh, purely uh, theoretical complexity, meaning polynomially and not exponentially, it's still going to be maybe a large polynomial, but, but non-interacting fermions ultimately are, are easy to simulate. Um, that means uh, now non-interacting bosons happen to be, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the latest results in the domain, but I think it is believed that the non-interacting bosons are sufficiently universal uh, on the one hand and sufficiently hard to simulate so that one can imagine a uh, quantum computer build out of non-interacting bosons. But uh, that one, I, uh, so I don't think there is a uh, there is a lot of work in that because it's rather complex. Uh, uh, rather well, okay. So there is the the problem of boson sampling with a lot of uh, work being done. I'm not sure if if anybody understands how to do error correction in these domain in this domain. Um. Another question, can you start formulating the physical problem other than with a tight binding model? Um, well, um, so in principle, you can use a, uh, I mean, sure, you can use a, so, so first of all, you can use a different basis. Um, uh, similar linear systems appear in other uh, models of quantum transport. There is the network model. If one wants to simulate the Dirac point, uh, there is the staggered Fermian model that that one has a non-local current operator and comes from high energy physics. Uh, so there are different flavors, but uh, uh, essentially, uh, in most contexts, your contexts, if you're dealing with uh, uh, non-interacting particles, you end up needing 
needing uh, a uh, to solve a linear system uh, and you uh, you also need to uh, you usually you want to rely on sparsity so uh, you can you can apply similar reasoning to other related problems and to wave transport more general but uh, they're not going to be too different Um, and uh, perhaps one last question, because I'm also looking at the time. Uh, why do you need to carry all of this quantum information with you instead of treating it classically? Uh, do you expect uh, the interaction of surface modes in the case of topological bulk that depends on the geometry? Uh, could you give example of uh, what can happen on the mesoscopic scale that you're looking at? Ah, all right. Uh, well, uh, uh, my favorite example is uh, is Majoranas. Uh, that so so consider what you really want to figure out is uh, in simulating Majoranas is properties of a single state. Now, this single state uh, does exist exactly at the edge of the nanowire. But its localization properties are uh, are determined by uh, the bulk of the nanowire. That one, in order to be uh, effectively macroscopic, that one needs to have uh, sufficiently many Fermi wavelengths, or just a, just needs to be sufficiently large. Uh, and on top of this, you also want to add a superconductor to the system. Now, this and that's where things become tricky uh, because. The superconductor uh, has a much shorter Fermi wavelength, and uh, now nobody actually does this part of the simulation. Uh, well, doing this part of the simulation exactly would require uh, would require immense amount of computational resources. But basically, you need to glue a, a faithful simulation of a single electronic state, where you are interested in the properties of one wave function with the physics, the low energy physics of a semiconductor that certainly contains uh, quite a bit of uh, Fermi wavelengths and there's the spin orbit length scale. There are all the different length scales uh, in play. And on top of this, you need to couple the system to a superconductor in order to correctly simulate how proximity works. That turns out to be doable, but a hard problem and uh, and actually, a simulation uh, can teach you a lot. Uh, moreover, uh, I, I, tomorrow I'll probably bring uh, an example of, uh, of an insight uh, that a master student in our group realized just, uh, 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 just by doing numerics and trying, th trying things out that was rather inspiring. All right, um, so I'm looking at the time and uh, it seems uh, that, uh, that it is time to wrap up. Uh, if, if there is a really pressing question, uh, uh, I do welcome it, but otherwise uh, enjoy your break and uh, the next lecture. Or... No, no, you actually have a bit more time if you, you want, but I, I, I don't know if there are more, more questions in, um... You have even half an hour if, if you want to use it, but also we can. Uh, I think I think it's uh, I, 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 I'm, yeah. it's okay. I think I think it's it would be it would be reasonable to to stick Just to the schedule here, and, and, and need okay. take a break. Uh, also for the sake of people's ability to follow the next lecture and also, uh, yeah. All right. Not sure if uh, too 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 much of me is probably not a great idea. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you very much, Anton. Well, still, if you have more questions, uh, well, there is another uh, lecture tomorrow, and also you can use Slack and so on. Uh, since uh, we have a slightly larger break today, uh, the uh, talk from Claudia will start at five p.m. as we have it scheduled. Maybe it's a good occasion that you can take to take a look at the poster. Uh, channel in, in Slack or to all further discussion, whatever. So we leave it here for now. Um, we'll see you back. Wait, uh, do, oh, oh my, my goodness. Did I forget? Oh, I, I did misread the schedule. I, my lecture is until 4.30. But it, it, but it, 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 
it is fine unless you i don't know if there are more questions that, that you want yeah to ask. uh oh I, uh, okay. okay uh that's that's <laughs> That's my bad. Uh, yes, okay, that is a miscalculation. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is probably a good idea to stop here because uh, otherwise it would be complete switching of gears and uh, and I did uh, cover a specific topic now. So it's no problem. I, I think it's fine this way. And yeah, if uh, there are more, more questions, you, you can answer them also tomorrow. And um, just one thing, uh, I wonder, would you mind to, to share your, your notes? Uh, maybe in yeah, the of course. Yeah, yeah sure thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll upload them somewhere uh, shortly, probably in Slack or so. All right, perfect. Thank you. Well, then um, let's uh, take a break here and we'll be back around 5 p.m. All right. Uh, see you all tomorrow.